The forest is a closely knit community of plants and animals. It is the product of a long and still continuing process of development. Broadleaf forest, so characteristic of the southern fringes of the Great Canadian Shield, rests on the rubbish dumps of ancient glaciers, on land which was sculptured into its present form during the last ice age. At that time, some 10,000 years ago, great ice sheets covered the region, and the land was scoured by the grinding pressures of the moving mass of ice, which left behind great heaps of rubble when it melted. As the ice retreated northward, the forest came close behind. The development of a forest involves competition between many different types of trees and vegetation. Competition for the sunlight, which all plants need. Competition for available moisture and minerals in the meager soil. Much of this competition, this battle for light, moisture and food, takes place between the seedlings on the ground. On the floor of the mature hardwood forest, maple seedlings are in the vast majority. For not only is the maple a plant which can survive with little sunlight, but also it can penetrate easily the heavy litter of maple leaves on the forest floor, an advantage shared by the dog-toothed violet and a few other plants, plants which grow where the maple grows. In developing to a more or less stable community, the forest passes through a succession of changes how these changes occur can be studied in areas where the balance of nature has been disturbed, often by logging or fire, or where there are deserted farms or lumber camps with clearings long since abandoned. Among the early plants, which spring up in these cleared areas are bracken, goldenrod, and others. Among the trees which are first to appear are the aspen and the white birch. Any of these hardy trees will provide protection and may create conditions favorable for the small spruce trees, which eventually make their appearance. The fox at this stage begins to invade the area to prey upon smaller creatures which have come in to take advantage of the new vegetation. Another newcomer is the groundhog. Several years have passed and while the birch and aspen are growing strongly, the young spruce and pine are quietly multiplying their numbers beneath the protection of the foliage above. There is now sufficient cover to attract forest dwellers like the deer. Later on, the spruce and pine will overtake the birch and aspen, which are short-lived trees.
Here amid mature pine and spruce, we can see old birch trees dying out. One more stage in the slow march of progression is reached. But the dominance of pine and spruce is only temporary. At each stage in this development, the current vegetation adds its quota to the litter of the forest floor and subtly changes the balance of the soil. Now the amount of shade and the condition of the ground are such that the red maple will begin to appear. The maple's ability to penetrate the litter soon makes it an active competitor with other seedlings. In the course of time, the maple trees will be almost as high as the old pine trees. By then, the formation of impenetrable layers of dead maple leaves on the forest floor will have made inevitable the final victory of the maple tree. Soon, only a few huge pines remain and maple has achieved supremacy. And so today, in the forests which spread along the fringes of the Laurentian Shield, maple dominates the scene a scene which reaches its peak of magnificence in the fall. For the inhabitants of the forest, the fall is a period of change. For the deer, it is the time for mating. The buck's neck swells and his antlers become fully grown. The near approach of winter, too, causes the coats of all deer to thicken. For the beaver, it is the time for final repairs to his dam, so that the water level is maintained before his pond freezes over. For the chipmunk, it is a matter of storing as many seeds as it can before the snow falls. Millions of seeds are destroyed each year by the teeming rodent population, and this profoundly influences the plant population of the community and thus the balance of the forest. As the fall advances, the forest begins to lose its leaves, starting with the upper story, the canopy. Winter in the forest is a time when the trees are dormant. For the animals, it means an intensification of the struggle for survival, a long fight against sub-zero weather and lack of food. No open water can be found and bark and twigs are a poor substitute for fresh green leaves. With the warmer weather, the rising sap will ooze from the bitten twigs, periodically to freeze again into icicles. But by now the worst is over and the bursting buds are a welcome meal after a long period of fasting. The coming of the thaw leaves the forest floor covered with many pools of snow water. These provide early breeding places for the many creatures like insects and frogs and toads to lay their eggs. It is the spongy humus of the forest floor soaking up much of this water which makes the forest such a valuable conserver of moisture over large areas of land. Spring is the blossoming season. Maple flowers appear before the leaves come out. During this time, sunlight can reach the smaller plants on the forest floor, like the white trillium and the red. 
But soon the peak of the flowering period is over and the trees are in leaf. This is the time when the inhabitants of the forest community give birth to new life. There is plenty of food now for the yellow warbler to raise a family. The youngsters of the forest always have some protection during their early development. The fawn, for instance, has a white spotted coat which provides excellent camouflage. At this stage also it lacks the scent which will later attract its natural enemies. During the coming summer it will have ample opportunity to grow sufficiently independent before the critical winter period returns. The forest is an integrated community of living things. The trees and plants through their leaves receive energy from the sun and transform this energy into food. And the animals like the deer in turn feed on the trees and plants. Where numerous, deer may cause extensive destruction. But although the maple seedling here loses part of its foliage, it will usually survive. Even when the stem of a young seedling is bitten off, a new side shoot will generally grow upwards. beaver, on the other hand, uses trees and bushes for the building of its dams, while the bark and leaves provide it with food. Insects, one of the smaller living things of the forest, can cause a lot of damage to foliage, particularly if there are many of them, as in outbreaks of the forest tent caterpillar. The toadstool represents another group in the forest community, the fungi. Often living on trees, they decompose the wood, the decomposed wood later adding to the humus content of the soil. The pallid Indian pipe, though a flowering plant, possesses no chlorophyll with which to manufacture its food. So it too, like many of the fungi, lives on other vegetation. The industrious ants help in the process of decay. Here, way up above the forest floor, they tunnel through the wood of a tree, opening it up to infection by fungus spores. But not all forest creatures are destructive to the vegetation which gives them sustenance. Some are beneficial. The bee takes nectar from the flower, at the same time doing the job of carrying pollen to other flowers. The butterfly and many other insects do the same. When a member of the forest community dies, there are others like the ants, eager and ready to deal with the remains. Nor do they confine their activities to dead creatures, the living, too, fall prey. Insects and their larvae, too, are a welcome change in the diet of the mice, which live for the most part on seeds. But mice, at the same time, provide food for the bigger members of the forest community. The marten, for example, one of the swiftest hunters of the forest.
We have seen then how a forest is a balanced community, sustained by conflict as well as harmony. We have seen also that although this balance may be destroyed, the forest will in time restore itself, always following an orderly succession. For man, the forest is a part of his natural environment. From it, he still draws materials for his daily life. Today, it is more than ever a precious heritage of beauty and natural harmony to be preserved and enjoyed.